So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is August 20th, uh, 2014. And um, we had planned to, we've taken a couple weeks off, and uh, we planned to come back together uh, tonight to talk about going back to school and launching Youth Voices and all. Um, but uh, some events have transpired um, with the shooting of Michael Brown in um, Ferguson, and so we're going to weave that into the conversation. Um, and somebody who's been uh, doing amazing work, um, if I may say so, um, uh, on, on Twitter around uh, Ferguson's uh, syllabus, uh, hashtag Ferguson syllabus is, is Marcia Chante. I, you told me, but I didn't get it right. Say, no, say. Marcia Chatlin. Marcia Chatlin, sorry. I was looking. Marcia Chatlin. And Marcia um, so graciously said that she'd come on and kind of talk to us. But let's let's um, get introductions from the others who are here. Um, and then we'll, we'll turn to you for a little bit, uh, if we can. Um, you, I think um, this is Marcia's first time um, <laughs> on Google+, Plus, or one of the first times. And I think that's true for you, too, Alicia, right? Yes, first time. Or I don't know if that's true. Alicia, are, hi, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Alicia Lobaco. I teach at Fremont High School. I am going to be teaching a sheltered English 4 class. Um, yeah, Joe introduced me to this whole youth voices world and really excited about it. Cool. And we, we were talking just before we started broadcasting here, maybe, uh, but, but uh, that sheltered means that you're working with students new to the country, is that right? Yeah, um, so the class that I'll have them in, most of them will have been in the U.S. about four years. Okay, and Chris, welcome. Chris Sloan is already teaching, I think. Yeah. Chris, you're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we, yes, we're back in school. Our, yesterday was our first day, um, and so we're in the throes of things. Um, and, um, yeah, interested to talk tonight because some of the readings that I had students do this summer and will do this year are kind of tangentially related to social justice kinds of issues that I know. Fremont High School you know, studies, and then, Marcia, I know you're, you know, you've thought a lot about those, so I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Joe, welcome. Hey, uh, Joe Parizo. I teach with Alicia at uh, Fremont High, and I have all seniors um, for English, and as well as for a senior seminar, which is their senior project course. Uh, so I have kids double blocks. Um, yeah, and I'm really psyched because uh, Youth Voices, it's, it's also part of a larger grant I'll get to work on, which is nice because now I feel like uh, it'll become a much more prominent part of my course. And I just kind of want to see, um, now that the kids have a separate senior project class, what we can do just because I have more time with the kids, which is great. And just to mention, you, you guys did uh, went to the Oscar Grant movie did you not? Yeah, we, we did. Class. We all we all went so. to go see Fruitvale Station. Uh huh. And then we wrote uh, letters to the director, uh, Ryan Coogler, and we put them on our blogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so just to say, Karen, welcome. Hi, I'm Karen Fassenpower, and I uh, live in the far south corner of Arizona. Um where we also have a lot of social justice, race-related issues that are, this resonates with me. Um, and I do commu some community management with Youth Voices, and I'm going to kind of be here in the background tonight thinking about connections on Youth Voices. Great. So, and and I teach, I'll, I'll say it, and then we'll turn it over to you for a little bit, uh, Marcia, um, uh, at... Um, New Direction Secondary School. It's been a while since I've been there. Anyway, in the Bronx, and um, you know, uh, we did quite a lot of work in the spring around Jordan Davis, and um, so um, kind of imagining kids are going to say, "Are we going to deal with this?" So, so that's one way to start the question. Like, uh, I mean. <laughs> 
Chris Lehman says that issues like this, when, when people say he's a principal um, in Philadelphia, uh, that when people say things like, should this be in the curriculum, he thinks that's even a crazy question. His, his question is, why isn't it in the curriculum? So that's sort of my perspective. But having said that, let's introduce Marsha. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yours, what you've been studying, and how you got involved with um, the hashtag. Okay. Um, yeah. My name is Thank you. Marcia Chatlin. I'm um, an assistant professor of history at Georgetown. Previously, I was um, in the Honors College at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I went to the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, which is about two hours, two and a half hours from Ferguson. I um, was originally from Chicago, and I went out of state to Missouri, and um, I have a deep love for the state of Missouri. I feel like half my life happens there. Um, when I was working on my PhD at Brown University in American Studies, every summer I worked for the, um, the Department of, um, uh, I guess they would call it Gifted Education, and I worked with um, students who were in the Talented and Gifted programs at the University of Missouri campus throughout the state of Missouri. So um, besides kind of my general concern as a citizen about what's happening, in Ferguson, it really cut um, close to home. Um, at Georgetown, I teach classes in African American history and women's history. Um, my first book is coming out in March about the African American Great Migration, and I'm working on a second book about the racialization of fast food. Um, so in a nutshell, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and I spend a lot of time watching cable television, which are two <laughs> habits that um, take up a lot of my time but I enjoy. And um, I really have seen some really wonderful things around the Melissa Harris Perry show. Every week she sends out, you know, the syllabus for the weekend. It's a Saturday and Sunday um, news program, and they do the hashtag Nerdland. And what I love about the Nerdland hashtag is the level of engagement among academics about critical social and political issues. And so when I was watching um, her show this weekend, I was trying to use the Nerdland hashtag to really challenge other college professors to dedicate the first day of school to teaching about Ferguson. And a lot of people said, you know, sure, I'll do it. Some people resisted it, but I said, you know, this is the most important thing that's going to happen to our students in their political and educational development. They're too young to remember Los Angeles. Um, some of them are really, um, they were too little to really remember 9-11, and this is going to really kind of shape their political and educational consciousness. So I asked some people, you know, will you dedicate the first day of class to, to Ferguson and to Michael Brown? And then I said, you know, what's going to happen, which often happens, is that people say, well, I don't know what to teach, I don't know what to say, can I broach these topics, and then the excuses start. So I said, well, why don't I provide a syllabus that's, uh, multidisciplinary that asks people to you know bring in resources and that way we can't say well we don't know what to teach and then increasingly um, I was thinking about if a kid saw Ferguson on television or if they lived in Ferguson the resources that would be available for smaller children and then I said well high school teachers would want some of these resources too and as I tried to get more people to tweet with the Ferguson hashtag we started to see multi-grade, you know, multi-level, um, and one of the things I like to say is multi-climate readings that can be incorporated in a, in a number of school settings. I understand that there are things that I can do on a college campus that K through 12 education, depending on what part of the country you're in or what moment your school is in, every type of material won't fly, and so I thought it was really important for um, people using the hashtag to be really um, respectful of that fact. And then we moved from tweeting out resources to tweeting out questions that would um, correspond to whatever class you were teaching um, that first day. And so the response has been really amazing. I think people have been really excited and really generous and charitable in, in seeing this as a possibility and seeing this as something to embrace and, you know, not to be afraid of. Cool. So, um, this won't be an interview, so everyone jump in here. Um, I think you know that. Um, now here. But um, 
can you say a little more about um, or maybe two teachers who might not want to do this the first day? Like, is it is it just like, well, you know, too bad, this, this you really should do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I respect whatever choice people make, but one of the things that I, I will be, I will push about is, okay, if you don't want to dedicate your first day of class to this, this is fine. But understand that this is going to be in your classroom whether you acknowledge it or not, and to see this as a real opportunity to engage with your students and to help them think through some really heavy stuff. I mean, this is, this is a national crisis that's unfolding in front of them, and so I think they would um, expect that, you know, people around them are talking about it. It's really a challenge to find the language to connect with young people about these issues. So what do you guys think? <laughs> Jump in, please. So, I guess I'm asking Joe, Alicia, and, and Chris to, to jump in with, you know, are you going to deal with this early, or how, how are you feeling about it? Um, I agree with Marsha. I think it's a, for, but for my particular popu part of the population, I'm just, I guess my, that, also leads, that also leads to my question. Um, I teach mm -hmm. all mainstream English language learners. I, uh, some of them are long-term English language learners, so they would have gone through the newcomer program, had courses with Alicia. Um, but there's, uh, I guess, a connection of a majority of those students being here and being, um, I guess, being speaking the, in terms of the community, how do you explain it or how do you work with it with students who are like, in Alicia's population who are a newcomer course, I w I'm going to do this. I will do something. During, it's perfect for my senior seminar course. I'm thinking of my teachers in 9, 10, 11, um, and then across our language population, language ability. Um, just, um, I don't know, in terms of resources, have you seen any, have there been ones, Marcia, that are just, you know, school starts for us next Monday. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, you know, like... So is the concern about language proficiency and ability to communicate? Um, yeah, or just the, in terms of connection to certain communities more so than others. You know, I can see it very much resonating with some of my kids, much more so, much, much more so than I feel like with others in terms of anticipating. So I'm just wondering, yeah, maybe it's, it's language ability that I'm speaking about. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'm glad to see. I'm I'm really heartened to hear about pe a lot uh, overwhelming positive response to doing this on the first day. That's that's super heartening. And can, can I ask, uh, as you're answering that, the idea of one day doesn't feel like enough either. I mean, no, yeah. people must have said that back to you too. But so yeah, go. Right, yeah. right. I mean, that's a it's a it's a suggestion that I think resonates for people who say I don't want to do this at all. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the first day just become, becomes a symbol. Um, I know that some organizations are going to try to encourage a student walkout on Monday. Um, you know, basically the idea of Michael Brown didn't get a first day of school and that young people have to mobilize. So there's different ways of kind of interpreting that. Um, by no means I, I do I mean that literally, but I do think that the idea of addressing something so heavy on the first day can do a lot to reduce the tensions and the issues that will, that might um, rise up to the surface because no one is talking about it. Um, but I think that the language issue is a, is a, is a good one. Um, I, I, one of the recommendations I made for um, foreign language instruction is, you know, it's a, lot about, it's a lot about skits and situations. If you had to explain this in another language, how would you explain it using, you know, the skills you have? Um, another thing is to ask just really abstractly about the issues that surround it, right? Um, what is a right? You know, what rights do people have? You know, um, even at its most basic level, you know, is this fair? You know, what's your idea of fairness? So, so that for people who, um, for students who may not 
be so engaged in the particular moment. I think the issues surrounding it are a good place to start to talk about kind of the, the structural issues that have created so much tension. Yeah, and so um, we actually, if I could jump in, um, we, we started school yesterday and, um, you know, so I didn't actually, you know, I didn't lead with this uh, story. But, um, you know, I thought it was interesting because I, I teach in a predominantly um, white middle class school in, in Utah. And, um, you know, and really there wasn't anything said. But after class, my media class, uh, a Hispanic student came up to me and said, you know, um, have you been keeping track of what's going on in Missouri? Um, because there was also a similar incident in, in Salt Lake City. Uh, again, you know, a robbery at a convenience store and a shooting. Um, but, um, you know, again, unarmed kind of thing. And so I thought it was interesting that, you know, it was a student of color who brought it to my attention as the teacher after class saying, you know, have you been following this? And so it's definitely part of the, the fabric of what we do um, you know, during the year because we've done a number of looks at race um, and, um, and justice kinds of issues. So, yeah, I guess it pushed it to the forefront, um, a student of mine, and then, um, yeah, I guess that was really the thing that took me back was like, oh, a student is asking me about it, so, like, we should probably be talking about it. Well, so let, let me throw in the curve that many of us, sitting here at least, have a notion of the curriculum coming from the students, right? That um, that it's their questions, their issues that is the center of the curriculum, um, and we work we work that really hard, I think. I mean, and and we can get better at it certainly. So I'm just. Yeah, so that's where that's where we normally start with the, the youth voices curriculum. If there is one, like, what are your questions? We have kids pose, you know, ten questions about themselves, ten about the world, and um, you know, I work with largely Latino and African American students um, in the Bronx, and police issues come up, you know, uh, when you just say, "What are your questions?" Um, so and how they're handled, right? Um, how the young people are handled. So, so, I guess I, so I guess I'm wondering how, how much we can dive into the curriculum without it becoming us teaching them. Um, how, can, how can it be them, you know, exploring? So, <laughs> any thoughts on that? Well, I guess I would say, just like you just mentioned, Paul, because um, we are at the yeah. stage, and I'm just going to finish for a little bit because I think Marsha probably has something to say. But, you know, like, um, this is the time of year when we start off with, like, what kinds of stories do we want to do? We're, we started talking about, like, what did we do last year and, and was that what was good and what was, uh, could be improved on. And so we are at that phase, like you're talking about, where the students' inquiry kind of drives the research that they're going to do for the assignments this year in media. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I would recommend is if, um, I mean, part of what the hashtag did in terms of moving from resources to angles and framing, um, you know, how we see this moment in Ferguson as integral and not um, an outlier, right, in what is happening in society. So if we think of this as this is, you know, at the center and how do what we teach, like, interact with it, I think that we can, I think that, you know, this idea of, for instance, like, let's say, you know, um, if I were, in, you know, teaching U.S. history again, I would think about the larger themes that, Ferguson is pushing to the forefront. And I would just identify him the first day. You know, this is about, people would say it's about civil liberties. It's about how we protect ourselves. It's about private property. So you just say those three things and say, you know, and throughout the semester, throughout the next two months, let's think about these three big issues when we go from, 
you know, I, I forgot how they periodize it, like, I don't know, you started 1492 and you did like the entire um, North American history, or, or 1776, you know, wherever we're starting. Let's just keep these in the back of our head. You know, we're still talking about it, but I, I think that when, um, when I present the idea of talking about Ferguson, um, people imagine these really explosive and horrible, like, racially wrought conversations where someone ends up crying and someone's really upset. And what I'm really suggesting is how do we explain to our students what structure does and how structure structure operates in so many different ways. And I think that's where it takes the pressure off and it allows us to, you know, remain committed to the plans that we've made. Um, I'm in a position where I have incredible flexibility with my school year. And I know that, um, you know, teaching in other settings, we don't have that type of flexibility. So how do we pull out the really key thematics and help students return to this moment throughout the teaching process. And I have to say the most, kind of the most difficult thing was trying to figure out how do the sciences figure into this question? How do, um, you know, I came up with some ideas if you, if you taught fashion and textile management, how to still have this conversation about these issues. So, I mean, this has been like a really fantastic um, challenge to think about all of the ways that these issues are playing out in different sectors and different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Alicia, what are you thinking about? I was uh, just going to bring up one challenge that I foresee is that for my students, um, all Latino students with one Yemeni student and one Vietnamese student don't really have that much depth about um, knowledge of U.S. history, okay. and so I'm wondering how much I could have the conversation. I don't want it to be an ahistorical conversation because there's so much that leads up to this incident. Um, and then another issue that I would see myself dealing with is that, I mean, honestly, with my population, there's, there's a lot of fear of black people mm -hmm. in the population that I teach. And I've seen one, I've even seen a Facebook comment from one of my former students that was basically saying that he deserved to be shot. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions for me. Right, and one of the things I would, I would talk, I mean, I would say, um, you know, um, how do people talk about the police? Really, like, how do people in your, how do your parents talk about the police? Are your parents afraid of the police? Why, why would they be afraid of the police, you know? Um, I think that working, in my experience of working with students from immigrant populations, um, there's some themes that kind of resonate in terms of their parents' relationship to authority in their countries of origin and how they might think it's ridiculous, like, oh, my parents are so afraid of this, but I don't see why they're afraid. And, you know, I think that that's a, that could be an entry point. Um, you're in the Bay Area, is that right? Yeah. They're yeah. in Oakland, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that... Right, right near the fuel, fuel station, right? The, or the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Did you guys see Fruit, Fruitvale Station? Yeah, I yeah. took all the seniors last year. Yeah, you know, I think that I think that we, we have to move away from, like, I, I think the point you make is, like, well, if your students don't have, like, this, this, um, this accessibility with U.S. history, how do you make sure that they understand that this is part of um, a cycle? And so you might want to talk to them about... You know, like, you know, you know, people in Oakland, um, you know, they, they protested against police brutality here, you know, in the 1960s. How do you think it would be different if this happened in the 60s? Like, what do we know about the past? Um, you know, there, there are ways that you can kind of localize it so that they understand that this moment is part of something in their community. And that, I think, kind of pushes them to say, oh, this happened here? Right, because it's like students think they've invented sex and they've invented everything. Like they think that like they're the first people to come up with everything. And so when you say, well, you know, actually here this was a place where something like this kind of happened, or something like Ferguson happened in this community, I think that makes it a little bit more relevant and more real. And it just might be a matter of saying, you know, this happened on this street. You know, how many people know where this street is? Yeah, well, look what happened. You know, this happened there. Why do you think some of those things happened? And so. I think that kind of helps um, break that up. I, I struggle with some of that also. A lot of my students are international students, and they'll say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, okay, so what are some of the things that we can pull out? Yeah, so so, I, I'm, I'm, so I just want to say what's obvious 
but which is that a lot, what you just said, um, it, you described your students, and all of us seem to have different students. <laughs> so, and we're all different too, right? So, you know, a, a white guy, you know, in his uh, early 50s, going into a classroom of Latino and, and African American students like myself, that's a different situation than what you just described, right? And that's different than what Chris described and Joe described, at least. So it's like, how. It's important to take all that into consideration, too, it seems to me. Um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I used to teach, I mean, I used to teach at the University of Oklahoma, and I was there in 2008 during the election. Um, there was a lot of tension, a lot of mistrust, a lot of the president's a secret Muslim, um, you know, this, mm -hmm. this is going to end my guns kind of thing. That's, that's, that's where they are. <laughs> that's where everyone is, right? And so I understood fully that every conversation about race or about social structure, maybe students didn't want to necessarily hear it from me, but I think that's when it became very important with what you were talking about initially, about letting them set the tone of what we were going to talk about. So I wanted to say, no, the president's not a secret Muslim, are you crazy? But that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> So instead, I said, okay, well, tell me about how people talk about politics in your town. You know, what are some of the things that people are saying about the election? You know, what are your parents' perspectives about the election? What are your grandparents? That's, I mean, that's where I had to go and say, okay, that's an interesting, you know, what do you think is really shaping their thoughts? And the yield isn't that wildly different on some levels than a conversation with maybe a group of African Americans about the election and about the symbolism of it. But I understood that um, they were going to have to set the tone. And I would recommend with your students, I'm sure they have very strong feelings about the police. And yeah. maybe, maybe that's what sets the tone. You know, I mean, they've, they've, this summer they've seen Eric Garner in Staten Island. They've seen Ferguson. I mean, this has, like, been a terrible summer for um, a lot of young people, particularly young people of color. So to say, what do you think's going on? Because that question is probably a lot more than anyone's talking to them about this issue. So, the, so, the, so in that conversation, and we can move to other issues, but what worries me about the first dayness um, mm -hmm. of what you proposed, and I get it, I get why, but is, is, is establishing that trust. Like if you walk, you know, I mean, why should they say what they think is going on to me right now, right, or to, right away? They're, they're, does seem to me like establishing trust is an important part of it too. Of course. You know, and, yeah. of course. I would never suggest anything that would um, foreclose that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think that, um, again, in different settings, different things can happen. But at the most basic level, I am afraid of kids going into a school building after something like this terrible has happened and not a single person in authority even recognizes that something really bad has happened and continues yeah. to happen. And whether that's a conversation or say, you know what, this summer seems there have been a lot of stuff. Here are some, here are some questions we're going to think about throughout the year. You know, I think that suffice. But um, from my understanding, some people have been advised at their schools to not discuss this at all. I mean, it's I like... I can imagine it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, it's like if someone dies or something, you know, it's like, well, we're just never going to talk about it. It, it. it seems bizarre to me. And this is the thing that I am, I'm hoping we can find ways to um, resist. So, Karen, what, do you, what have you been thinking there? You've been chatting here alongside. Do you want to jump in with some thoughts as well? Yeah. Well, I, wanna, I do want to bring a comment from the other chat room, um, which mm -hmm. is from Kathy. And we were talking about sort of different ways to enter this conversation. And, and I'll just read what she said. I, th I think there's so much polarization in the U.S. right now. I've actually decided that the overarching theme of my course will be creating community and what responsibilities we have for each other and for what the U.S. is. And I really, that just yeah. resonates so much with me. And I think also, Paul, your, your comment about the first day, I mean, I think, you know, we talk a lot about classroom community, and I think that's sort of, part of the challenge of if, if you haven't built that community within your classroom, I mean, you're really, you're jumping into the deep water. I mean, I, I said in the chat I, I would do it anyway, but I think, you know, it's, 
it's right to think about it. And I like your I like your thought about let let the students drive the conversation. And I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a teaching opportunity. It can be where are you with this? And I think just in this short conversation, there's so many different entry points into this from immigration issues to civics issues and I really like um, what Marcia said about I forget the words she used but just a, a multi um, sort of climate I think mu yes multi climate approach and I think you know we need that and, and also Kathy's comment we need that in every conversation in America right now and there's so it seems like we're just we are getting so much more polarized and then it does just make it ha hard to have conversations I mean I think as an adult in sometimes in situations with people who have very different um, ideologies and outlooks on issues than I do it's sometimes it's hard to have a conversation because we we do we just seem to be pulling apart instead of looking at you know there's a lot of ways to talk about this and and then you start building that community and building bridges to having real conversations about things that are really important because we have to have conversations or our whole country is just going to fall apart so that's what I'm thinking thanks so I mean duh I the other thing is Youth Voices is set up so that, you know, I, I, it's really, inter it's again, really interesting to me as we describe our students, right, um, just on this panel, um, how, si how segregated, and I guess it is, how segregated the schools are, and at least Youth Voices is a place where, you know, Alicia, your students could meet some black kids, and I mean, not that they haven't, I know, I don't mean to exaggerate it, but um, so we need to get the topic up there pretty fast too. It seems to me, so that there, you know, there's there's a diversity of of views and perspectives and where people are coming from. I think that would be one way to approach this too, Chris. Yeah. Um, the um, some of the more powerful moments on Youth Voices have come in those clashes. You know, remember Paul. Now it's a, many years ago, I guess, but uh, when it, uh, Obama was first elected and my student was at the uh, Grant Park in Chicago and she was writing about the exuberance and then one of your students took her to task about kind of uh, race or was she being racist and that kind of thing. But, you know, like those misunderstandings from these faraway places, like so my student in Utah felt like she was being misunderstood by this, uh, you know, student in the Bronx, um, actually led to some really, really good conversations about race. Uh, and then, like last year, when we were able to do hangouts with um, Joe's students, that um, you know, connecting with people and meeting them just as they are uh, was like my students were really moved by that. You know, like that was a real powerful learning conversation. Those conversations, you know. Yeah, I want to echo, we wouldn't have had, we had that moment last year where, and I use it because it just showed what it meant to bring another classroom from far away into the conversations, like in that space, and it was the one when Lauren said, asked, asked the two girls, what, so do you all have any uh, liquor stores out there, and, and the girls just like fell out the floor laughing, like no, absolutely not, and it was our students. It's so they're so inundated. We have food deserts. Like there, every corner, every store is a liquor store or a corner store. And it, and to hear that it wasn't that way in some places from people that they had established a relationship with. If you know, even if it was all through the commenting on the posts. I mean, it still met. I don't. I could see my kids, their brains when I watched that footage. Like it's it's amazing to see that they. They were just not aware that it could be different. Some of them were, but just to hear it so bluntly. And the reaction, the girl's immediate reaction was so just... Right. And and my students, uh, you know, also um, to get this different perspective on, like, teen employment. And then the girl who was Iranian, like, she made this connection with Bassam. And, you know, like, there was this also these times where there were these nice connections that I don't think they expected. Yeah. But it's all about, like Karen was saying, it's all about having those conversations with these people 
in very different places and very different communities. Yeah. Agreed. Well, that sounds great. And so, so we need to do this pretty fast. This um, meaning um, <laughs> hangouts and and get our kids together and talking to each other. Um, can, can I? I want to be a little more prosaic though, and kind of English teacher ish in in saying that if I turn to my kids and say what happened this summer, there's going to be like they're going to have impressions, thoughts, feelings, all that's important, but they're not going to know a lot of facts. Um, you know, they're not going to really know what happened. And that feels like an opportunity to me. Like, uh, you know, there's this real important thing out there that are attached to all these amazing feelings you're having and difficult feelings. Um, looking at the facts feels, and doing some really close reading feels like a great thing to be doing around this topic. I think, but, that, we, I think that we can't get too, I mean, but yes, they will not know a lot of facts. They might know a lot of innuendo and things that people are saying. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes when the conversation breaks down is that um, I think that we have to be really, um, I think that's when being broad kind of helps. Like what what are people's, you know, like why do you think there's so many tensions between this and, and the police might be the opening versus so do you think that the prosecutor was being irresponsible in his comments, right? I think sometimes when we know so much, and we know we the level of discourse that we we desire. Um, that's when I think sometimes it's 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 very difficult for me to listen to a student say something that's completely ahistorical or historically inaccurate and let them finish the sentence. But sometimes the at the end of the sentence is really kind of the profound moment for people to talk because I know these ideas will be corrected throughout the semester, and that is like excruciating for me. But I think that we have to. Um, think about this very issue. Are we talking about this to circulate facts? Or are we talking about this to circulate a modality of engaging about race and about tension and about conflict? And you're, you're certainly saying the, the, the latter, right? It's, it's well, about I the think, modality. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, we, you know, it's where we're at. I think in some places, like, you know, in a law school, you can do a lot of the fact stuff and you know, but with, with most of the students that we have at their age, we're doing a lot of kind of figuring what this is all about. And I think that sometimes we have to separate the two in order to get something, um, you know, to get something going to build a type of community that we're, that we're envisioning. Let me, let, let me press that a little bit further then, because it seems to me that what happens pretty fast is that students want to and are ready to tell their own stories of, you know, interactions with the police, right? So telling those stories would be an important thing to do. I mean, and I've been shocked. I don't, I don't know why shocked, but recently it ends up being students telling stories of how their parents have been, uh, you know, abused by the police. So it's like, oh my God, you know, you're not telling your story. You're telling what you saw happen to your mother, you know. So, so that's so telling those stories feels like an important thing to do early on too. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I still want to get to the I I do also want to get to the facts. So I I mean, you said that too. Like, yeah, but yeah, eventually. And I think it's also important to try to cover multiple, all the perspectives of the story, um, because last year one of my, a couple of my students did really, I thought, a really good podcast on, you know, there's a flare-up of gun violence, and um, so they interviewed people who had, whose jobs required them to carry firearms, and I thought that was, like, that was a, pr a really good interview um, to talk to, you know, um, a police officer. And so, you know, part of this thing I think is really important is to get everybody's voices heard. So, what are you all thinking? <laughs> um, I think I'm mulling it over. Like, I'm trying to look at it because Alicia and I both teach uh, the senior research project. Our populations are just different populations, but we're we're both. And Alicia, jump in, like if you think if I'm misstating. But we're both we're both teaching it also from the framework in which we're looking at our course and where 
one, Labaco's focus, Alicia's fo focus is is there will be some more language building, like that the skill building in a different sense. It's like, but we're both approaching it from that social equity space in terms of the senior project, and she's going to be uh, trying uh, work to because this is her first time teaching sheltered or English four is using like literary theory and lo looking at looking at things through through equity lenses and looking at things through a post-colonial lens, a feminist lens. That, that's that's what we're talking through right now. So I'm just saying for um, Alicia, like I can totally see where when we ask the students at the beginning of the research project about, um, you know, because the senior project takes them eight months, it has to be something that they that they focus on where they can be, they're very passionate about it. So that speaks to, you know, it's, there's something has to drive that for eight months. And when we, Alicia, when we ask that question about like, what makes you angry when they're trying to craft their topic that first month that we're doing this. Um, this is something, like you said, if we're looking at it from an organic way, some kids will, and like more of the kids I'm assuming in my class, will talk about issues with the police or issues with, um, like that's something that would they would be willing to spend eight months because they're angry. They're, 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 you know, their blood boils with when they think of it. And that's what we I encourage them to do when choosing the topic. But in... I do appreciate the narrative, that, that piece that was said, I forget who said it, the narrative approach, Paul, I think you said it, where it's like you look at it in terms of a storytelling. What what does it bring up in terms of stories with your own family's experiences and, and your own experiences, like just that broader? Because then that conversation is a different conversation simply because you changed the structure, the, that storytelling component. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just, in my mind, what's going through my mind, Paul, is me and Alicia have, the same project to work on together and collaborate on. Well, are are and you thinking of using a text in that, or a text in in early on in the year? I am. I have for well, f specifically about Ferguson, or in gen like, like. What, what do you mean? Your plans so far? Oh yeah, I mean I'm introducing each of the lenses with a different short story and a different nonfiction text. I have the short stories picked. But I don't. Have I have I have different texts picked, but they're going to spend the first six weeks just getting that conceptual foundation with the the four lenses that we're focusing on. And Alicia's doing something similar with the senior, right? Alicia, yay! Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me throw. I mean, if if we had Girl, been talking about this before Ferguson, like the the other, and and so here's a. There are like three questions in my head. Right, sorry. the 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 other big issue that happened this summer is, is around the, the you know the the children on the border, right? Um, and and like, how did that fall off the pages of the newspaper, right? I mean, there are still children on the border, right? They're still well, so yeah. so so so. I have a couple questions. Like, I w I want to bring that to kids too about the summer in some way, and then. But then, but then, then I feel like a an ambulance chaser, right? And I don't want to feel that way either. Um, so, yeah. Any responses to some of that? <laughs> I mean, I I think that I'm biased in that um, I always open with current events. The first mm -hmm. ten minutes is devoted only to current events. The students can decide what current event, but we talk about it, and then they keep in the back of their head and they find the connections because I teach history. It's it's it's, it's easy. But the one thing I will say is that, you know, what are the themes that tie the border crisis and, and, and Ferguson? It's youth. It's youth being sent into, mm -hmm. these, into these contested spaces. And that's something that all of our students can relate to in some way. And so I think that, um, again, we cannot, we don't see this, uh, I don't see this as, you know, you talk about Ferguson, Missouri, as if Ferguson, Missouri invented struggle. You talk about the thing about that struggle that is resonates with our students, whether it be an under-resourced school, a segregated community, young people kind of risking it all in order to, like, fight for something. And so, um, you know, I think a great place to kind of... It's interesting. Before this started, I was trying to get... Um, educators commit to teaching about Freedom Summer this summer. For the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, someone do something to com com commemorate 1964. And then this happened, and I said, wow, all the dots are connecting. It's about young people in the line of fire 
And so if that is the thematic, right, then it gives you space to say, you know, there's this border crisis that's also happening, and there's this crisis that youth are expressing themselves, among other people, but we see a lot of young people on television. You know, how does, how does this fit into what we're going to think about for, you know, this, this period of time? I think it puts, I think it, puts it in a, in a position for students to be able to see the connections. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, others have thoughts? I, I could jump. Alicia, did you want to say something? You... No, just my, my brain's kind of turning a okay. lot, especially because we're thinking of our, Joe and I, the senior project of equity and inequity. And I think asking students questions and seeing what their own connections would be between Ferguson and with the un unaccompanied minors, because I know with them there's so much passion behind the unaccompanied minors issue, and I can see that being a really hot-button topic issue for them. But I'm just curious, just to start the class and to start the year with lots of questions for them, to see what their own connections and opinions are, and especially looking at it through the different lenses, how that may shape the, the conversation. Yeah, and I'm kind of interested in um, maybe working um, uh, in a parallel fashion with what you're doing at Fremont this year. You know, last year we, we, we started talking because my students were doing a research paper, and Joe, yours were kind of at the tail end, or it seemed like, of their research paper. So, um, you know, I'd like to coordinate just that process. So when you're trying to work through topics uh, and things that they care about for eight months, I want to kind of adjust my curriculum to make the research paper maybe spread out a little bit so that then they might have conversations at those important times when they're mulling ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm kind of change in my curriculum to kind of match a little bit of what you're doing there. Because I think those conversations were really good. Sometimes, though, they were out of sync. So I want to kind of try to sync the timeline. That's just a personal note right there. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. No, they, um, in terms of, a, in terms of a, like, dates or windows of opportunity, um, Alicia and I, we, we shared similar dates she's gonna we're in terms of because she's we're doing again we're doing the same senior project basically um, that by early October the first week of October they should be they should have done a lot of that questioning work so that's happening all okay. of September um, but they have to turn in their their subtopic categories their thesis statement by Monday October 6th just you know in its that's where they're turning in all these questions they're asking. So mm -hmm. sub September is the month of of probably posting and the wonderings. And Joe, um, Joe yeah. you, you guys are starting on Monday, right? Oh my God, yeah, we are. Yeah. So I, I want to throw it back to Marsha one second. Um, I, I was really interested in when you said that um, you were earlier you were trying to get people to think about uh, Freedom Summer. Um, and get educators to do that. What's your passion, what's your push to get educators to work together? Uh, I mean... Well, I, I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's just important for us to give each other really good ideas. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, I, I, you know, it's, it's a weird thing because I have colleagues on a faculty, but we don't talk to each mm -hmm. other about what mm -hmm. we're teaching. Why would we, right? We all teach something different, so you know, my colleague's a specialist in Russian, and I, um, you know, I have confidence that he or she knows Russia, and I don't know anything about Russia, but occasionally we have these moments where we actually talk about what we do in class, and I think that um, what's been good for me with the hashtag is I see what other people are doing, people are seeing what I'm doing, and we're kind of saying, oh, that's not a bad idea. Um, you know, college and university teaching, you really, you know, if you if you're into it, like, you know, your slides are already done. You know what you're going to talk about. Um, and I think that incorporating current events keeps you on your toes and it keeps you thinking in a certain frame. So um, the, the Freedom Summer thing was really important to me because um, 
there was such little national comm commemoration of the war on poverty, because I think people think it failed, that I was afraid that the summer would go by and there'd be little commemoration of the college students in Freedom Summer, and largely because some people believed that that was a failed effort. And so I was encouraging people to get the documentary, screen it on their campuses, and talk to college students about what they were able to do in 1964 that was a success and that had a lot of doubts, that had racial conflict, that was an unfinished revolution but is still worth something to invest in and, and note that it happened and it was important. Great. Right. Okay. And since we have you here tonight, can you also talk a little bit about um, your passion and thoughts about gender and girls and oh yeah, so young women? Yeah. Yeah. So my my book's about girls and girlhood, and one of the things that I mean, I I think that um, it's become kind of a joke um, to my students. Well, they'll find a topic and they'll see like how I can connect it to whatever our classes. It's like this thing. They're like, if I threw out this topic, how would you connect it to this? Because this is, this is one of the things that I'm stronger in in my teaching. There are a lot of things I'm not very strong in. But I think that... Um, I think <laughs> get, get, what's an example of that? What do you mean? Like I'm not good at? Yeah. Oh, God. I'm, 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 like, I'm not good at coming up with like assignments. My uh -huh. assignments are so-so. Um, I hate grading. I, I always like <laughs> computer management. Like, I mean, my hats go off to how you can teach so many students and keep up with your grading. I don't know how you do it. It's so amazing to me. I mean, I just get into the grading vortex and I don't know what I'm reading anymore. I'm very bad mm -hmm. at that. Um, but the one thing I, I think that I do find important is to historicize the present. And so um, in talking about gender mm -hmm. in particular, I mean, again, I see this moment as about these conflicts about, um, you know, who should be out in the streets at night. You know, one of the things that they keep on saying is that, you know, there are children and there are women here, so you shouldn't be throwing tear gas. Why do, you know, how do we come up with that idea? Um, the leadership on the ground in St. Louis, a lot of those people are women, but the national leadership of civil rights organizations are men. I think that could be a conversation to have with students. Um, we could also talk about um, if a victim of um, a police shooting is a man or a woman, does it feel different to us and why? So I think that, um, you know, I don't, th I, I don't think that there is a moment that we can't talk about race or gender or class in a thoughtful way. I think that it just is a matter of understanding that our students might not go with us all the way, but that's not the goal. The goal is to teach them how to think in these lenses when they see a moment so that perhaps they make better choices about how they're going to act on an issue. Interesting. Yeah. I also think that for students, this is, this is also the, my last plug about this, is a really good opportunity to talk about voting and voting rights because this is something, um, you know, that comes up that has been in the news a lot about who's allowed to vote, why, you know, especially um, for those of you who have seniors who might be getting visits from people for voter registration. I think that there's a whole, like, civil liberties thing um, that could be really, really um, productive in the older students seeing themselves in their next kind of iteration as adults. Mm -hmm. So, um, where are we? We have a few minutes off. Karen, did you... Uh, I didn't see your response to my question. Did you? So... Yeah. Okay. Maybe not. Uh, okay. Oh, let I me, think let actually... me do it anyhow. So let me let me play with this though. Look, CL MOOC, right? Is something and and play. Chris, did you want to do something else? Actually, I thought Alicia was going to say something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Go, but I'll get back to that, Karen. I'm going to get to you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Just going to say, I have an appointment at seven, so I have to oh, get off the call a little early. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to finish here in just five minutes. But yeah, go ahead. Other thoughts. Right. My yeah. mind is totally spinning with ideas now. I'm thinking about I wanted to incorporate nonfiction and media a lot more into my class, and I'm thinking, how do I do that if I'm also introducing language and these different lenses and thinking about starting off with nonfiction and media pieces about Ferguson and doing having that be my nonfiction piece for the lenses for the first semester. So excited about all the possibilities that it offers. Cool. 
And and I did just to say I did collect together in a um, in a guru um, collection uh, fifteen. There's you know uh, J Cole's song is in there, and there's photographs, and there's blog posts, and articles, and lots and lots of um, stuff the kids can explore and play around in. And it's all set up so that they can interact with each other, and we can see and and so forth. So that's that's kind of available. Um, if, if you just go to youthvoices.net/slash Michael Brown, you'll you'll find that there. Um, but um, Karen, I do, so uh, you don't have to be the person addressing this, but there, Karen, just to say, put the help put together, and others did. Um, this wonderful bank of kind of assignments and work and and things to do. I'm just wondering where is, and it's all about play, and it's all not all about play, but there's, there's a lot of play, there's a lot of making, there's, there's a lot of um, reflecting on that making. How do these these big social issues kind of fit with doing that stuff? Is that, and we can just mm -hmm. leave it as a question if you want, but it, it does bounce around in my head, like, you know, right. Am I teaching scratch or am I teaching, you know, social justice? Right. Well, okay, yeah, I do see what you're talking about. I, I mean, I think that the, you know, one of the one of the core principles of connected learning is starting with things you're interested in, but but really, I mean, exploring exploring those issues and and agency and making around issues not learning scratch right so it's it's mm -hmm. we feel really strongly about this when we want to communicate a message what's a way to do that and then and then a million ideas bubble up you know we could do me and we I, when you first said this the first thing I thought of was when we did the meme stuff mm -hmm. People, a few people really got into some very deep social issues, and it was yeah. kind of a playful way to do it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that fits with this, but I mean, I think it's always about starting with the content and starting with your feelings, and and then you can bring in lots of things like language development or tech or civics or whatever. But if you well, start I, with something yeah. else. You know, I think it is worth remembering that that there's that we can play with this stuff too. You know, I mean, they're big, important issues, and we can be, you know, play in a big word. Um, I don't know. Yeah, Marcia, you have any kind of final thoughts for this evening for us, or um, thank, thank you. you for joining? Now, let me just say, we, we, one of the things we're sorry, one of the things we're committed to is connected learning um, as a concept and. Watching what you've done around um, the the Ferguson syllabus hashtag was amazing, and then it for you to so quickly respond and say, "Yeah, I'll jump into this um, hangout with you all tomorrow," was is really about connected learning. And so, thank you for connecting with us tonight. But well, my pleasure. Uh, there's going to be a piece probably about it um, on some public radio station. So when that comes out. I will connect it, and I will make sure that um, you know I, I talk about this experience of talking to people who teach um, in a number of different settings about the real challenges of this. But I really appreciate it, and um, I can't wait to hear how it went. <laughs> Great. Right. Thank you. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Um, and let me just, um, as we go out, just say that we're here every Wednesday night, and we're going to keep talking um, about this issue next Wednesday. Um, I've invited a few other people to come on. Um, I'll wait till they say yes before I say their names. <laughs> anyway, and and um, and so forth. And but we are still focusing in on how to connect our classrooms and using Youth Voices as one of those places to do that. Um, so. Thank you all. Um, we've been doing this several years. We broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up um, many years ago now. Thank you all for stopping in tonight, and good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.